sorry. You were I want to do a painting that big. Yeah, well, they big. wraps all the way around the wall. And if you look close, I don't know, it's just, they're smears of paint. And they're just blobs and smears, and then it's scrubbed layer over layer and scrubbed in. And he's just moving around like a madman with paint, with this freedom. And basically, he predates uh, painting in New York, this kind of abstract painting by 40 years. But nobody paid attention. But if you look at it now and reassess it, it's like, man, this guy was still going strong, but the world was looking somewhere else, and uh, that's what happens with art. So the next step we go to is post-impressionism. And the leader of that, I'd say, is Cezanne, the guy we're looking at. He was the most important one. And I believe there were seven or eight painters. They were all lumped together but they were all very different kinds of painters, but they were working with new phenomena. And that was like every other person was writing a book on color theory at the time. And um, there was all kinds of new sort of ways of doing things they were talking about in art. And I think Cezanne basically was somebody that was classically trained and everybody thought he was totally talentless he didn't have to, this he inherited some money from his father and some land so he didn't really have to worry about money that much he lived like a broken down bum in an old farmhouse and he just painted and he painted so much that you know working with these loose ideas but everybody looked at him because his work was loaded with the most ideas and he didn't want to have much to do with anybody and the word came down. He was in Paris for a while. He couldn't take man that I went through this. Went back to the south of France and painted the rest of his life. Didn't talk to many people, but his gardener, I think his mailman. And um, he sat out on a landscaper in his studio and worked feverishly on his paintings over and over. He kept changing. As he changed them, it just got a little more awkward and weird, but solid and beautiful. And what it says here is that, and I know it's fun for people to read to you, <laughs> especially in the morning, but Cezanne felt that Impressionism lacked form and structure. That's true because he said it was just basically about light and atmosphere. He brought intellectual order to his work by carefully exploring the properties of line, plane, and color forms of perspective. So that's basically what he's keying on are those formal um, areas of line, plane, color, and how they all fit together. He discarded traditional forms of perspective. So he's going back to the way they painted before they found perspective, often emphasizing all objects with equal intensity instead of the ones in the back, it's softer and lighter, you know, and get more foggy. They're all sort of in the same focus. That's how painting was before the high Renaissance. It was early Renaissance painting. His designs were two-dimensional and emphasized volume with the use of vertical planes. Okay, his compressed space and solid geometric shapes greatly influenced Cuba. So what they're talking about is instead of those two triangles going back into space, like I showed you on landscapes, um, he's not doing that so much. Let's put this up here a little bit. His is like, when you look at the other paintings, it's kind of like you can run into them and run into the space. If you run into Cezanne's, you get your foot inside the painting and you hit a cement wall because he's sort of flattening everything out. And he's kind of, as he flattens things out, you notice how this gets puffy and bulgy. And as they say, volumetric, really three-dimensional. The background is starting to push the image out of the space of the painting, okay? And then the next phase is cubism, which really does that. And I'll show you that in a minute. But anyway, he's important because, like I said, there was Van Gogh. The next guy is Gauguin. Then there's Saran, Renoir. And they're all sort of looking at Cezanne, and then they're drawing their own conclusions and doing it their own way. Okay, so the next one is important. Well, here's Neo-Impressionism, which is a misnomer because he's a post-Impressionist. And that's George Seurat, but he's a guy that painted with little dots. And this painting's in the Chicago Art Institute, and it's a huge painting. And I remember going and seeing it a lot, and seeing it in art history class, it always looked boring and sort of clinical, like a surgeon's painting, because everything's so clean and neat and organized. 
and it's pure little dots of color put next to each other. When you back off, it turns into other colors. They mix in your eye, optical color mixing, he called it. And he was as close to impressionism as you could get in the next phase, but it was so much different. He gets nailed that just because of his little use of dots. And it's got, he's using impressionistic themes, the day in the park, that kind of thing. So it says here, the term used to describe the stylistic tendencies of Seurat and his followers. Uh, what to say? The term used to describe the stylistic tendencies and his followers, period. Hmm. That's not true. But anyway, they combine the physics of light and color with the experiments of the impressionists to develop a method where hues are mixed visually by the viewer. This technique called pointillism or divisionism is achieved by systematically placing pure dots of color next to each other. And, and let's see, the colors were affected by the relation to each other. Okay, so he's got red and green next to each other. And as you back off, they sort of jump back and forth between each other and your eye and they make it brown. Um, and created a pattern surface in the perspective depth, often in rigid structured compositions. This style required numerous scientific experimentation. So when you look at this, they're almost like cutouts. And when you're looking at the freedom of the painters in this group, he's more closer to medieval painting than he is or early Italian Renaissance painting, just because of the figures almost look like carved pillars of wood. And he's using them as an excuse, of course, for structure and composition. And he painted a lot of paintings. And this painting alone must have taken forever. He died when he was like 36 years old. I figured those dots finally did him in. My own must have drove him nuts. But anyway, he's important in a way, especially to Matisse for a period and a couple other painters, but Cezanne's still the heavyweight. And here, I'd say the second most important one here would be Gauguin. Okay, and Gauguin was uh, king of painting light in life. He was a stockbroker. And he left his family to become a painter, basically. He started painting and he got a little worried, you know, oh, it's got a hobby now. So he finally took off and he went to Northern France and he came across a group of painters out in the middle of nowhere in the woods and a town called pont -Avon. And he was at an inn there and he saw all these wet oil paintings out in the hallway. And they were so strange and weird looking. He never saw anything like it. So he hung out and waited for them to come back and he befriended them. And, uh, uh, the main guy, his name was Emile Bernard, and Bernard sort of, he's got paintings that look like this before Cezanne, I mean, before Gauguin. So he hangs out and paints with them and then steals all their ideas and goes to the south of France to meet Van Gogh. So here it says, Gauguin developed a method of synthetism, which consisted of applying brilliant color on boldly outlined, flat, simplified shapes. So nobody's using color like this this pure color and all the figures become more of a pattern almost or a form and see he's doing the same thing though as Cezanne that red background is coming up and it's pushing these volumetric figures farther out of the painting but also he's not so much like Cezanne in the fact that he likes flat patterns that become more like decoration almost like a cut of piece of wallpaper re slapped down to become something else um, this decorative style was inspired by folk art, medieval stained glass, Egyptian and Oriental rugs. Uh, his works were a complex mixture of themes derived from Western cultures portrayed in Eastern style. I don't get that. It's, oh, it's probably the like Chinese silk painting, kind of flat space with the little figures in the back. That means they're farther away, but they're all on the same sort of plane anyway. Um, his primitive style and exceptional compositions were combined with vast symbolism. Followers include the school of Pontavon, who he stole from, Benabe, which was uh, a famous painter, French painter, mainly was uh, Pierre Bonnard, and the symbolist, uh, Redon, which I'll get to. There's a few in here. All right, anyway, so it's, he's very important to Henri Matisse. So is Cezanne, but... For, I'd say he's more important in Cezanne for Matisse because of the color and the flat pattern. And that's what Matisse's work in the next phase, the next generation, sort of 
challenges Picasso, who is Cezanne in the next generation. And here's Picasso, the Cubism. We saw this already. Now, Matisse was the first guy to start hitting on things, and he came to painting late in life, too. You know, he was supposed to be a lawyer. And his parents wanted him to go to law school. But anyway, I mean, it's interesting the way Gauguin and his life sort of intersect. Here's cubism is like when we talk about Cezanne, which we just did in the beginning, I think what Picasso does is, okay, Cezanne's pushing that figure or the still life out of the canvas and the background starts coming forward. Well, in Picasso, the background comes so far forward that it's interchangeable with his figures. The only thing that's sort of making you see the figures better is the color. I mean, if I started putting blue patches on this, they dissolve into the background. You see floating heads and some body parts. So with cubism, the figure in the ground or the background become the same, painted on the same sort of flat plane. And all he did with Cezanne is, he, instead of those little brush strokes Cezanne had, he made them big, flat planes. So Cezanne's is more like chiseled rock. Picasso's living in the machine age. It's more like chunks of metal. If you can imagine, uh, say, a piece of wood, a wooden wall, and somebody comes with sheet metal and cuts it up in angles and rectangles and starts slapping it on top of that wall and overlapping and layers, and it builds up and it makes almost like a sculpture on a wall. That's what painting's turning into. They talk about it more as an art object. You know, before it was something you could walk into. It was a window on the world. Now it's more of a thing on the wall. Yeah, it's a canvas, it's a rectangle, and it's hanging on the wall, but it's got this surface on it, almost like a cloisonne jewelry box or something like that. And you may think about it that way too. It becomes an object instead of a representation. All right, so this sets everything off for the 20th century. I mean, from the start of this, this is about 1907, up until even now, even Devoncorn in California in the 70s, it's still based on cubism and Matisse's color, okay? And here's Matisse's first movement was fauvism. And direct um, response to Gauguin and the pure colors, um, except the difference here is that Matisse is a lot more crude. And he's a lot more direct when he paints. And when he's painting this sort of things, nobody's ever seen anything like this before. And basically what it is, is French expressionism. Fauvism was coined by an art critic who never saw the paintings before. And he went to a show and he walked inside the show and he said it looked like, it, it means wild beast, I believe, in French. And he said uh, when he walked in, it looked like paintings that were painted by wild beasts slinging paint around and just smashing it on the wall. Because everybody was used to salon machines, the nice polished paintings that were refined and worked on in technique. And here's a guy that comes along and looks like he's using sandpaper and whatever else he can rough and just rubbing it on the canvas. It's Madame Matisse, I'm sure she was flattered at her beautiful portrait. But here it says, a French movement which used rich, powerful colors applied boldly. The name means wild beast art. And the movement was comprised of numerous individual styles which expressed emotions through distorted color. Um, yeah, and there were a lot of other painters in this movement. There was Albert Marquet. Um, who else was there? I'll think of him in a minute, but it only lasted a year, basically. And he was painting down in the south of France, and then I think he went back to Paris. He was bouncing all over the place. But, um, I mean, for this, young painters saw this and really took to it. And then the Germans had their own brand called German Expressionism. But I think old Matisse was there first, and they took Matisse and sort of made him more these bright, alarming colors. But what I have to say about Matisse is I saw shows of his. And the last one, was in San Francisco, and I've seen a lot of paintings they had down there in books. And they always looked so much brighter in books because I was a little disappointed when I got down there. They were dull. And I think maybe uh, could have had to do with time or whatever, but I think sometimes 
you, you can get really surprised by things you think that don't look that good that you see in reproduction and it works the other way too. You think it looks good and you go, oh, bummer, you know, it doesn't. So that's the problem with reproductions. And oftentimes I spent years looking at the same slides at school and pictures showing them in lectures and things. And, you know, I'd go to Chicago and go to the Art Institute and there'd be some of those paintings and they were completely different. So, you know, you never can tell. And it's like people, when they, when we used to look for jobs, we had to have slides of our work and, you know, people would send in slides and they look great. And when you see their real work, it wasn't that great. So it's, it's a coin toss, I guess. Okay. I'll move on. Now, just for cubism, this is the second half of cubism. The first half was analytical and that was Picasso looking at something real and making it abstract. The second phase synthetic was Picasso would just sort of start drawing lines and slap down paper and he'd start making something out of reality into the painting. So it goes from uh, looking at real, making it abstract to going abstract and putting real things inside of it. And then it runs its course after, mm, I'd say about 1918. And then he sort of keeps that whole idea going later through his whole life, the way he started with cubism, but he tries using Matisse's color and all that. And it goes on and on. He actually invented with Julio Gonzalez metal sculpture, which is what they do now. I mean, that was the ground level right there is welding. Nobody ever thought of that. So here's your symbolism. Odeon, Ridon, and he did some beautiful pastels. And this is an oil painting, it looks like. Yeah, oil on canvas. And it says here, a style linking art and literature by using symbols from romantic cultures, often invoking imaginative narrative situations. It was a reaction against the naturalism of impressionism. So instead of looking at nature, they're, they're working more in a deep dream state. It's not quite surrealism, but it's starting to point towards surrealism. But it's, it's this blur, blurry, amorphous world that you can't really, you know, it's all soft and swirly. There's always flowers floating around. And I remember being in Chicago at the Art Institute again, and I was having somebody look at Picasso drawings, and they were showing me Picasso drawings. And we were going, I thought I had some. They turned out to be prints, but they looked really a lot like drawings. But I got in there, and they bring out the drawings. And somebody was doing a PhD thesis on Radon, and they had some work out there, some paintings on paper that were pretty big. I never saw it before, and it knocked me out. It's like, geez, and it brings to mind what you see in books. You know, sometimes uh, makes your decision like you like it or not, but you don't always see everything. I mean, a lot of things never make it into reproduction from private collections or whatever. And I never saw these they were really bright blue skies with gold stars, kind of landscapes that were dreamscapes. Absolutely beautiful. So I changed my uh, changed my thought on him. Okay, so, oh, and his, his pastel drawings are great. He did a lot of vases of flowers like this floating around, and they're a really excellent work. Okay, then they're half real and half dream, it seems like. Okay, and there's Art Nouveau, which was pretty popular. This is our friend Gustav Klimt, the guy that used to put all the gold in his paintings and all the pattern. Well, here, this is an early one. So he's still oil painting. There's a baby up here. And all this pattern and all this swirly stuff and all this color lumped together. And it says here, an international movement started in Europe. His style displays the excessive use of flowing and curved lines based on plant forms. Used in decorative or applied arts to pattern or ornament buildings or artifacts. So, yeah, all you got to think about is a metalwork on balconies in Paris with all the swirling curves and all the layers. And, I mean, that went on for a while and furniture and everything. And then I guess... It, it sort of bottoms out with Art Deco, which we'll get to in a minute. But here's another guy that could draw as beautifully as anybody, just simple line drawings. And if he never painted, I would have loved those. You know, I would have still thought he was a major artist. And the same with Seurat. He's the guy that did all the little points. He's got some beautiful conky crayon drawings that uh, hold up to his paintings. Okay. And here's the Russians getting on it. 
And this is during the time of Cubism. And their thing was, well, we can beat the French at their own game. Because the French are abstractionists, but they always have something kind of real in their paintings. Like Cubism always had figures or still lifes, maybe sometimes a landscape. And even if it was very abstract, like a little nail painted uh, realistically, like with a note hanging off of it or a piece of newspaper. So here they're going for pure abstraction. So how, how much more abstract can you get than a gray square on top of a gray square? You did black on black, white on white. And I mean, for its time, it's really revolutionary. But then the thing is that if painting's about reduction, where do you go from here? You start painting walls, you know, if you start at this point. But anyway, there's a lot of theory behind it. And sometimes it's like the theory is as important as the picture. And that gets into sort of conceptual art, which gets big in the 60s. Okay, so we'll move on from that. Now here's Mondrian. And he was pretty important. I think, and I, I know I started looking at these things. I don't know if I talked about them to you yet, but I had a teacher that used to say, you know, if you look at it, like it's a black field behind it, like it's a deep black space, like a void and imagine these shapes floating on top of that and how one comes forward and the blue goes backwards. I'm going to find, but I got a poster in here. I've been looking at, I've been sitting around going, Hey, wait a minute. You know, if I look at this and it's all abstraction again, is how you train your eyes. You almost have to retrain your eyes to look at things. It's like, well, this could be the top of a cube and you're looking down on it and this could be the front of it. So then when I'm looking at it, it's like I squint my eyes and I all of a sudden see a cube popping out of this flat space. And then this one, I don't, the one I have is square. So there's more going on in it, but even if I took something like this red triangle here and connect it to this, this could be the top of another cube and that could be the front of another cube, but it's at, almost like at a different angle. You're looking at it at a different angle. So I imagine there's three or four different ways to look at these, the longer you look at them. But all you need to remember is basically use black and white and primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, not in this one, and right angles. So what happens is that at some point, an artist picks out a handful of things that they stick with. It's like a working guide. I'm going to use these five tools. And it's like, how many different ways can I come up with something new just using these five tools? And that's a game painters play as they get older. When they're younger, they get more charged on emotion. You know, I feel this way about this. And, you know, I mean, people, painters still do that when they paint a long time, but a lot of painters just pick out a problem for themselves and stick to it. And that way they can keep working steadily through on something without, you know, your emotion flying off the wheel one day and then another day it's something else. So the paintings are more consistent that way. It's more like a working man's approach to painting. Okay. So, and then another Russian movement was constructivism where they really started using wire, plastic, and whatever else they could get their hands on and start making art forms out of industrial things. And very abstract. And a lot of these supposedly are small mock-ups for buildings as big as downtown skyscrapers. So it says, began as a Russian art movement concerned with the union of art, engineering, and technology. They used new and unorthodox building materials and sculptures and architectural projects to help create interior space. So when they say help create interior space, I'm thinking, well, a sculpture, if you got it in a room, it creates a space because it breaks up the real space and you got to look through things, you got to look through the negative shapes and everything else. Okay. So I'm going to move that. And then there's futurism. Okay. And futurism was in Italy. It was around the same, this is all the same time this is going on, okay? Early 1900s, right before World War I. So Umberto Boccioni was a sculptor, and the futurists were, well, they were led by a poet named, P, uh, what is it, F.P. F. Martinetti or F.T. Martinetti, and he was a fascist, basically, and he got these young painters all worked up about, you know, um, 
nationalism, Italians. And their thing was, well, all the art done in Italy since the Renaissance doesn't matter anymore. It's us that matter. And it's the machine age and all this business. And they go in bars and start fights under the guise of being fascist and we should go to war. So World War One breaks out and they go into the war and most of them get killed. Then they change their minds really quick and the ones that survived moved to New York after the war. But here the futurisms are talking about things moving in space and melting into space. So you've got a running figure basically and it's like a camera, a long exposure where the things are just peeling off the images it runs, they're blurring. But it's a bronze sculpture. And, you know, it's basically cubism. It's their own version of cubism. And their theory is okay, but it never really takes hold until New York in the 50s with Jackson Pollock doing his drip paintings because he's actually moving his body and the paint's spraying from his brush as he moves around as he stands on the canvas. So it's like frozen tracks or frozen movements of something that happened one day in one time and that was it you know that's it's a fact on the canvas so this is more of like almost illustrating it it can't break through into the real thing but it's not supposed to yet okay and that's sort of futurism kind of you know a lot of these things flat and they got merged into something else or they fell into history that is it's pretty uh interesting because it was uh basically a slap in the face of people that thought in high society that thought they had good taste and knew what art was. So they find objects. There's found objects. Um, Marcel Duchamp, this is by Man Ray, but Marcel Duchamp takes a urinal and he sends it to a show in America signed R. Mutt. And then, you know, that's his sort of tongue in cheek thing is America's Europe's Mutt, you know? And then he would, uh, do all kinds of weird stuff. I remember uh, being in a critique in college and a guy marched in with a big roll of canvas, pins it up on the wall, takes a can of motor oil and dumps it on the canvas and says, it's oil on canvas. And I'm thinking, too late, buddy. Duchamp did it in 1914, you know? This is 1978. So anyway, they were um, a very different group. Actually, it's like the comedy troupe Monty Python, they sort of have that Dada aesthetic and punk rock. It was all that stuff that offended people and later it became part of culture. But let's just say uh, an iron ready made, they go find things and put it on a pedestal and just the way they displayed it, isolated, made it art. And then that's what Andy Warhol's thing was. It's art because I say it is. <laughs> all right. Here's surrealism. Salvador Dali. And of course, with Dali, he's uh, painting dreams. So he's sort of illustrating dreams. I got somebody in here. Let's see. Edmund. Okay. So Dali's illustrating dreams, dreamlike states. And there's another part of surrealism. This is called heuristic surrealism. There's one called absolute, where the painters, they say, they disconnect from everything and they go into the subconscious like a trance and paint, like Juan Miro, Spanish painting. But, you know, they're very abstract paintings. And I think that if you've got a brush in your hand with paint on it, it's kind of hard not to be connected to what you're doing, no matter what kind of trance you think you're in. But then we don't have, that's a little bit different. Let's see what a movement launched in Paris by the poet Andre Breton. So a poet's, a poet's calling the shots. He ended up coming to New York, Breton, and then he influenced uh, a lot of painters, mainly a painter named Herschel Gorky. Okay, based on searching beyond the real or the surreality of subconscious mind, artworks often convey a dreamlike quality through bizarre juxtapositions of incongruous elements rendered in realistic detail. Based on Freudian theory and influenced by the effects of World War I, the art produced often provokes ambiguous, disconcerting, and unsettling feelings. Branches di diverge from highly abstract to naturalistic renderings, often with personal unexplainable symbols. Well, they diverge. The highly abstract is the one I just told you in a trance, and the naturalistic renderings are these. So there's painters like this and Rene Marguerite and a whole bunch of surrealists that 
sort of realist, hyper realist with weird images. And then the other ones are highly abstract, but it's sort of the same concept, I guess. And the Bauhaus was where all the artists worked. You know, after World War I, it was a highly influential art and design school, which was established in Germany about 1918 and continued until 33 when it was closed by the Nazis. Nazis couldn't have any of this stuff because, you know, it wasn't nationalistic. It was a threat to them because it was ultimate freedom and individuality. Its initial emphasis was based on the equality of craftsmen and artists, but later stressed technology, industrial design, and architecture. Big on architecture. Okay, school treated design and manufactured objects as art and originated many modern concepts of design which affect contemporary artistic ideas. It was influenced by the international style that centered on building design and construction and by the modern expressions of the machine age. So, all you got to do is go to Chicago and you walk around downtown on a loop, and there's all kinds of Bauhaus buildings of design, the Florsheim Shoe Factory, there's all these famous buildings. and it was just because when the Nazis took over, all the architects went to Chicago. Why? Because it was Frank Lloyd Wright's stopping grounds. He was from Wisconsin and he worked in Chicago with Louis Sullivan. So all his work was there and they were in their Mecca basically for architecture. And then again, all the machine things, the whole buildings became art. Even the way they set up the factories were all very artistic. Like all you got to see is, um, the Johnson, the John, what is it, Johnson Wax Company in Racine, Wisconsin, where Wright designed all the furniture, and it's really like this futuristic building, like a flying saucer. But that's all part of it. Now, here's Art Deco, and to me, that's just, you know, they took Art Nouveau and stripped it down to a minimal form, so they just get to the es essence of the design instead of loading it up with uh, extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. And so it's a design movement for the machine age, which brought art and industry together, often in inexpensive mass produced designs. The style influenced jewelry, fashion, textiles, furniture, and interior decorating. And I suppose it still does to a degree. Okay. And then before New York was a big place and there were art magazines and the internet, every section in America had their own regional kind of painters and the way they painted based on where they live. Uh, we might have looked at him before. Grant Wood was from Iowa. And it says an American art movement which focused on everyday aspects to convey cultural values of various regions, also called American scene art. Independent styles were developed as Ashcan School, which was the Philadelphia sloppy painters that went to New York, and Precisionists, which were like highly technical, hard edge painters like Charles Sheeler. But anyway, you know, there was John Stewart Curry from Kansas. And I mean, you can just go down the list, but a few of them got pretty famous and they all had their own style, but it looks like American painting before it was affected by Europe. You know, they still didn't get the word yet that they were getting in New York, with these new ideas of painting. All right. And this is 1930 and that's going to change really soon. Now here's Andrew Wyeth, new realism. And essentially, he was an illustrator. I mean, he's a guy that painted every blade of grass with a brush. And he used tempera, which was used way back in before oil paint. It dries really fast, so you got to work quick. Um, and in this new, it says this naturalistic revival was a reaction against the abstract movement, which was not universally adopted by the general public. It took a long time. And even now, a lot of people can't get it. Based on genre of scenes, the artists used illusionistic methods and controlled style. Um, let's see, controlled style to create positions from photographic exactness to near abstraction. Subject matter also varied widely. From intimate still lifes to vast landscapes. This art form is also expressed in two-dimensional life-size models of human beings in common, everyday settings surrounded by actual objects. Some sub-styles are regionalist, pop art, Photorealism comes in the 60s, and social realism was basically 40s, uh, late 30s and 40s. And here Stuart Davis was an abstract painter in New York, and they call it abstract formalism. I never heard of it like that before. To me, it's like late Matisse. If Matisse lived in New York and he worked for the WPA, 
for the government during the depression. But he's using the piece kind of color, but it's all hard edge. He likes to use words and letters, much like cubism. But there's something nice about it. And he painted a long time. But, you know, I can take a couple if I see too many of them. Señor, no se ha comido. No se ha atrevido. I'll start looking at the same. Okay. Social realism. And this is another egg tempera. And Ben Sean was a, basically was an illustrator. So a lot of these, they're trying to be important artists, even though they're more like graphic artists. But they have something, some kind of text behind them that says this is important because, well, let's say, an international movement depicting political and social situations often centered on the struggles of the poor and socially disadvantaged. In totalitarian states, it was useful propaganda and often in mural format. So we never got the murals up here. Well, maybe WPA murals, but they didn't look like this. And he was basically a very good drawer. So he's probably one of the best known ones and probably one of the more successful ones doing what he was supposed to be doing, even though he's still kind of stuck in the illustration thing a little bit. Kinetic sculpture or kinetic art means it moves. Okay, so Alexander Calder got famous making his mobiles, and you see him in every art museum you go in hanging from the ceiling when you first walk in. And well, he did a lot of other things, but he was a great inventor. He did huge welded metal sculptures too on college campuses everywhere. Okay, so three dimensional artworks, usually with movable parts that rely on machinery or natural air currents to achieve motion, thus creating a constantly shifting image and definition of space. Kinetic sculpture was first conceived by the constructivists, the Russians, who united science, technology, and art into non representational sculptures, abstract. Intermedia style also involved the combinations of orchestration of light, sound, computers, electricity, video media, and cinematography. Okay. And now here's Pollock with his abstract expressionism. What I talked about before is he's just <sighs> whipping the paint around and building up layers. And what it is, you can see kind of he dances on top of the canvas. These are all the directions he was going with his feet and his arms when he was painting. So and he's the one that gets the most run, but really the most important one was a Dutch painter named Willem de Kooning who came to New York in the 20s. A revolutionary movement which centered in New York City about 1950 and became the first international move movement developed within the United States. It was influenced by re refugee artists from war torn Europe and was based on freedom of individual expression, which was shut down there because of the war, it was characterized by large non-objective images. No image, just paint. And uh, expressions of feelings through bold applications and colors, based also on German expressionism. It emphasized violent color and distortion, not all of it. Also called action painting because it stressed the emotion involvement in the process of creating artworks. Well, mainly it was action painting because the word was, hey, you're in New York now. And all these poor artists had big empty warehouse spaces and no heat and cold water, but they could, they, they could get a big roll of canvas and some car paint or enamel or house paint and do these big works. And they said, it's like no longer an artist in a small studio in Paris wearing a beret and an ascot with a little easel painting at an easel. It's more like a physical event. It's more like a basketball game because you got these big arena spaces and the artists come out with buckets of paint and they have at it. So, you know, they called it more of a physical event. So it became action painting because it's more physical. And then there's color field, which came in the sixties as a direct reaction to what we just looked at. So you see when it's sloppy, the next round, it gets neat. And Joseph Elbers um, spent, I don't know, 40 years painting squares. <laughs> So it must have been pretty exciting. But I always say that if you want to know color combinations, look up Elbers because he's already figured out the colors that work the best together if you want to use them for a composition. And also, just the amount of colors. There's only three colors, but how they work and how they start glowing. And again, it takes a while to look at them. And you have to keep shifting. You know, you have to look at them for a long time. And then you start seeing something in the painting. And in our culture now with, especially with, you know, 
the quick take, the three, the split second computer screen image or the telephone image, the camera image. It's like everything runs by your eyes so fast. Some of this art, you almost have to stand in front of for 10 minutes. It's not like watching TV. You have to live with it a while. And it starts changing as you look at it more and more. And I saw that a lot in museums, especially with, there was a painter named Dad Reinhardt who painted this way. He was in New York. He was, I don't know if he studied with him or not. He might have. Reinhardt was a younger painter. But he had a painting, a black painting in uh, San Francisco, a huge painting. I walked by it and the painter told me, why don't you stand in front of that and look at it for 15 minutes? So I sat, you know, at the bench and looked at it. And as I looked at it, the longer you look at it, all of a sudden you start seeing purple underneath, rectangles coming through. And then you see another color, you know, like a lighter violet coming through, all this black, but you would never, and I mean, it was loaded. The more I looked at it, the more you started seeing everything that was underneath it coming through. But if you would have just walked by it, it would have been nothing, you know? Oh, it's just a black paint. Okay, and this was big in the 70s, the 1970 Earth Art. Uh, earth Works, they actually called them. This is Robert Smithson. And Spiral Jetty, he built into the Great Salt Lake. And, he, you know, I mean, I remember flying over it you know, a couple of years ago. The lake covered it up. It disappeared. And now the lake was receding and you could start to see it again, you know, and actually I thought, hey, spiral charity, what a trip. Nobody saw it in years. But this kind of art, you had to have construction crews, dump trucks, you know, it became a building project. And, you know, they talk about the big scale, like crystal, putting a curtain across the Grand Canyon, um, wrapping uh, the coastline of Australia, the big umbrellas in California and Japan at the same time. It's that kind of thing. It's kind of grandstanding. And the way they make their money, it's a uh, press. And then he did a lot of little studies and photographs and little measurements and things they sell off. And that's how they would fund a lot of this stuff. But I mean, I think people are still doing it. The last... The last guy that did anything like that, it was a smaller scale, was that English guy... Andy Goldworthy, I think his name was, something like that. He's the one that they did at the Young. Uh, he chiseled out the concrete or whatever. So they and just leave the spiral jetty there forever? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's there, but it's it, co it gets covered up, and then when the when the, it gets hot and the water starts retracting, you can see it again. So, and it's broken down a little bit, but it's still there, okay? And then there is the last one. Well two more, is minimal art, which was another 60s thing. And again, welded metal, starting with Picasso. But there's these big, stark objects. It could be from a sci-fi movie. It's just a big X inside a gallery, shoved inside a gallery, this big metal thing. And there were a couple of people that made these huge black sculptures. <clears throat> um, you see a lot of them in New York, public sculpture. But I think this is a lot what you see now when you go out to like civic centers and college campuses, big metal sculptures. Right? And this is sort of the beginning of that. Okay. And the last thing was in the eighties was neo-expressionism that came from mainly Germany and Italy. And this is an Italian named Sandro Chia. And these are huge paintings and they're really thick. And what they're getting back to is almost like German expressionism from World War I, but they're doing it on a major scale. And they're doing it with more paint, more sort of like abstract expressionist ideals of just getting in there and slamming the paint around and making something out of it as you go. So Ankiya's got a lot of symbolism. He writes a lot about things. But, I mean, in the end, you got to look at the painting. You can't worry about the writing so much. And it says a revival of expressionistic tendencies toward intense color, bold distortions, and crudity of rendering. Subject matter often deals with the aspects of life, vulgarities, violence, cynicism, and brutality, which was German expressionism. Okay? So there you go on that. So that's your little primer for, isn't that great? All the isms. If you take our history, you have to know all those isms, but it's not hard after a while. But starting in 1900, the late 1800s, isms start, and then it keeps going up until, eh, you don't hear so much about that anymore. It probably peters out about the 
70s when art just there's so much different art they're really you know every ism counts and ones that aren't isms count too it's like anything goes basically and when there was an ism that just sort of pointed to the fact that you have to work in that style for anybody to look at it because it's the happening thing you know i mean that's the downside of it okay so here's uh i showed you i'll back off of this this was my painting i showed you last week and i worked on my building front and i slapped it around a little bit and then i put eugene the jeep in there because it needed something and you know it's like i painted these in undergraduate school and graduate school blah but this one i just i didn't change the composition much i just kept painting on it and painting on it and then instead of just having an empty building i had to do something a little bit strange so that was that okay and then uh the other day tuesday i made a painting that was based on like i'm going to do a real painting of something and then i'm going to add abstraction so let's put that up and back off here so i started with a figure and then just simple shapes simple there was no nothing on the inside just a shape here and a shape back here just those three shapes and then i took lines and cut through in this sort of checkerboard pattern or diamond pattern going this way and going this way and then i started the paint inside like just like any other painting well i'm going to put orange here then i need it there i need it there i need it there you know and i kept bouncing around it and filling it in and then when it came to the end of class it was at a certain point i said okay i'll end here and then i looked at it the next day and worked on it more just put more paint on developed the figure a little bit more changed some colors and it's like, okay, I want to keep it kind of rough because it's more in a modern vein. And if I make it too slick, it's just going to look too designed too, you know, just too slick sometimes is not good and sometimes it is. Okay, so there's this. And then yesterday for the same class, I said, okay, let's uh, start one. It's just a pure abstract painting without a picture. And that's what I might do today just to show you something that can be fun and it doesn't have to be that heady like we talk about it in art history but this was basically just started with some masked off shapes masking tape some clean cut shapes bright colors and then i took paint and started messing them up and drawing into it and pretty soon i had a de Kooning painting now i need to work on this more but i put it aside because all of a sudden i start seeing things in it like a face a head maybe i can make a hand so it might go the other way and become you might become a little bit more objects instead of a total abstraction we'll see about that but today let's start another one just so you get a new kind of uh take on how to put something together okay so can i, can I ask you a quick question yes do you, do you mix all your own colors or you buy like i'm starting to go how many colors should i buy are you mostly mixing them or do you buy a lot i just i just buy the primary colors okay i buy you know yellow blue red orange green violet white and black and once in a while there's some extra colors there and i never really think about mixing color that much i think more about the gooey paint and i slap it on and if it looks good, I leave it. If not, then I paint over it. And I, for it to look good, I guess you just paint a little while and you start figuring out what colors you like. Okay. But I would just say, do what makes sense to you. There's no one way of doing it. But you don't want to price yourself, you know, out of painting. If you buy too much paint, it gets expensive. And it's yeah. like, how many of those colors are you going to use? So you should make a list of the colors that when you paint, you recognize that you use a lot. And then I would just key on those colors for a while and buy those. And then later on, when you feel like you need a change, add one or two new colors to it and start mixing them in. I think that's how you can learn about it easier. Okay. So, you know, what are you using now? Well, I have mostly the 
primary colors, but then I, I start going, well, it's hard to sometimes get that same color that I had back there. And so I'm wondering. Well, that's true too, because just because you mix things doesn't mean it's going to turn out like it's supposed to. And that relies a lot on the brand of the color, how much you paid for it. If it mixes good, if it's cheaper color, it always tends to look a little more dull and brown. So, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I buy my, I buy the cheap paint, whatever I can get my hands on because I like to use a lot of paint and I like to keep it simple colors because once I get fancy with the colors, there's just too much junk around, you know? And I, I mean, I was bought some colors the other day and there was a light violet and a purple, a dark purple. And I went, well, why should I buy the light violet? I can just mix light. Yeah. I can mix that same color with white. So, you know, if I put a puddle of white down and take the dark violet, dark purple and put it in there, I got my light violet. So you got to be careful of that too. They'll sell you, you know, all these different shades of one color when you can mix them yourself just with white an amount of, you know, one amount of the color you want to mix. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now what can we do here? What can we do? I got two pieces of paper taped together. So I'm going to paint right over the tape which hopefully it'll become plastic and solidified. But the first thing I want to do is this, is, uh, so this is going to be a non-objective abstraction, which basically means there's no picture. It's about paint and it's about different consistencies of paint, thick and thin, and you have to have a good design and it can't be too planned. It has to happen sort of out of some sort of struggle instead of having a preconceived notion of what it's going to look like. And I had a professor in grad school that used to use stencils and things, which I'm going to use to a few letters and stuff. But, um, and then he set up a structure underneath, like a really neat thing, really precise. And then you start messing it up. And sometimes the neat stuff can show through the hard edge stuff, but sometimes it all gets covered. But if you need it, you can go back on top of it. So let me do with this. So it, first thing, I'm going to start with a shape here. Let's do that. Whoops. This is a bad roll of tape here. What happens is you get turpentine or something on the end of it and it starts melting the glue. And it's a mess. It doesn't come off right. Okay. There we go. I've got that. Michael, how big is that whole design? What's the What's size? That? What is the size of your painting there? I gotta get I gotta get closer to this. Say it again. What is the size of the two pages oh. taped together? Um those I don't know. Uh 18 by 14, I believe. Let's see, that's about wait a minute. The whole thing is uh that's like uh, 18 by, it's like 18 by 25. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Thank it's you. not really big, right. but it's big enough. Yeah. If I got it too big, you just got to use too much paint, especially yeah. this kind of painting. Right. Okay. So, okay, I got one here. So now what I need to do is go to the other side over here and, uh, Put another shape, but I don't want it straight across. I'm going to put it higher up here. So, so there's an imbalance. Okay, we're trying not to make things symmetrical, and I'm starting on the edges because I'll show you in a minute. Make that one a little bit narrower there. All right. Because usually the human eye wants to start right in the middle. And I mean, that's just natural to do that. But if you get used to starting paintings in and in from all four sides, you arrive at the center and you got a better chance of it being convoluted instead of symmetrical, which makes it much more dynamic as a painting. So look, two sides I got down. If I do this, I got to make sure... I rub that really tight on the inside edge because you don't want the paint to leak underneath. Not that it's going to matter after a while. Okay, now I need something on the other two sides, the top and bottom. So 
I'm going to put something here right there and how can I do that okay I'll do this a triangle and then up here I'll do another triangle this way pointing down okay so get in there now when I look at it it's sort of like there's already th thing pushing coming up pushing up pushing up pushing down you know and it kind of moves your eye around the perimeter because it is on the perimeter and then when you look at the shapes that are made the negative shapes they're all broken up much more interesting than if it was just a grid or something like that okay now to get started here this is what i did yesterday i got some of these acrylic tubes and they're getting dry or they're getting empty or is it yeah. so i do cut them in half there's a lot of paint in there when you think it's empty so the top half and the bottom still have paint in so what I do is I cut them in half, and when I'm done, I throw them in a plastic bag so they don't dry out. And then you can get all the paint out of them. You know, you get your money's worth. Because, again, these things, they fill up with a lot of air. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'll start with green. Just something very solid. Too much water. So if I go slower with this, it covers better. Paper's kind of slick compared to canvas. So for me, it takes some getting used to because I'm used to rough canvas. Okay, just make sure it's got a good edge. And leave it sit a while before you take the tape off. Just so it doesn't leak underneath. Sometimes you can take it off too fast and it just doesn't do what you want it to do. Oops. Okay, so now another one, purple, cut it in half. Okay, let's get some purple on here. And I think, well, I'll put it here. And again, maybe I want to get that a little smooth so it looks solid. Go this way, mix it up a little bit, and then come back this way again. And it gets a little more solid color. Okay, and there's that. Now, I'll see that. Right here, let's try this one. There's my, uh, all right. So I got this too, pretty wasted. Well, you know. Now I got two tubes, and what I got to do is kind of split it open. Did I say this is messier way to paint? Good, good. Um, <laughs> all right, and then I'll take my red go up here and really and a lot of water in the brush and this is already kind of watered down so it's kind of a drag okay there we go there's some thick stuff okay Okay, there. Okay, now I need another color, one more, and we can continue. Uh, let's take all these out of here. Orange, some more blue. What else we got? Oh, that's good. Let's try that. Let me get this out of here. Gray. Okay, now I'll take my blue. 
That's another thing is, you know, I got all this junk on my hands now. And pretty soon it's sticky. The brush handles get sticky. And that's when the mess is really stuck, you know. Um, okay. So let's try, let's see if I got anything left in here. This weird right orange. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a little. All right. Now, a big part of this is kind of overlapping things, but I think at this stage, it's good to let things dry so you can overlap. And then when you get into the sloppier painting, it's better to do it all wet at the same time, try to finish your painting so everything looks like it's slipping together. Because this way, when it dries and you've got hard edges, you can slap more tape over. But when you start painting loose, and especially with acrylic, if it dries at a certain time and you try to go back into it and it's dry, it never looks like it's together. It looks like another layer on top that just dumped on top. All right. There's my first shape. Okay, now let's try something else. All right, come on. Okay, so, I mean, even this, if you start looking at it, let's talk about theory here. See how this thing's forward? That one looks like it's going back. I mean, just the diagonal, like that. It's like farther back. This one's a little bit bigger and it's darker. It jumps forward. But it's funny because the bright red should be so intense. It's forth, but color, you know, you know, you know. And it's like this one. This is a bigger green. That orange sits behind it. And it's just four shapes on a white, you know, piece of paper, basically. Okay, so um, I'm going to do this and use a magic marker to begin with. And let's see, I got a number four. I'm going to put it in here sideways. This is a shape. And I got paint on the tip of this yesterday, and now it's dry. All right. I got a different one in here. Okay. Let's, uh, hang on. I want to get a juicier marker here. All right, so let's do that again. And I'll, I paint them. I can do this with paint too, but it's just these things stick, the paint gets underneath them, and you get a mask. Okay, there's that. And then, um, let's see, let's do, uh, okay. Okay. That's good. And, um, then, Shouldn't have to, I can do some off the end. I don't have to have the whole thing in there. We're just using them as things, not necessarily letters. The numerals. Okay, so there's that. But again, when I'm doing this, I have to make sure that, you know, everything's in the field of my vision and it doesn't lean to one side or the other side. It doesn't get heavy on. So you got to split everything up sort of in equal amounts, even though they're all watch the pose or compare in different settings, different kinds of angles. Okay, so let's find another one. 
Ideally, this would be dry, and I'd go right over it, the green. I'm afraid it's not dry. I'll try it, but... Oh, it's okay. I didn't have to go much over it anyway. Okay, so I got that. I'll put these aside for now. Sometimes you got to think of different size planes or shapes. So I got this green one this size, but I might need eventually in the painting one that size. So you start playing big off of small, and then this can come across here. Okay, so this is the mechanical portion. It's very mechanical, straight edge, just masking tape. All another shape there. It's still wet, so I'm going to take one down there. And one down here and come across here like that. Okay, that should give me some kind of structure to start painting. Okay, so you can see how it's starting to break up already. Now, um, put this magic bunk over there and get this thing. I mean, Gives me a little more room. All right. So um, let's see what to do next. Let's start painting in some of these littler shapes. Just to get it going. So blue here. Maybe I need some here. Maybe some up here. Down here. Okay, and some there, just to keep it sort of going everywhere. Okay, so now I can pull out my brush. Too wet there. Okay, get that in. Okay, there. 
and some of that I feel on there. Okay, some of this. Go up here. Back down here. Okay, so now I'm starting to break up the precision a little bit more. Get a little sloppier here. Which, you know, eventually it's going to have to be anyway. Okay. That too. Now, uh, another color. Just find another one. Just get some more stuff going. Okay, so. Between this now, I'm going to start with my phone. Uh, yeah. Let me try to see if there's some paint there yet. Yeah. I'm going to go back and There. Okay, so now it's no longer two halves. Um, you can squeeze a little bit more on this too, but you're happy there. Okay. So I got a basic layout. So now what I need to start doing is uh, moving some paint around a little bit. So I'll bring out the heavy duty white and I'm gonna mix it with something here so I can get started on laying down the slabs. Here's what I'm doing. This tube has a little bit of green in it. Just put it right in there and mix it. I 
that's kind of the shade we're going to go for. Is that kind of look of paint where it's. Looks painted. And the texture counts. The texture of the painting really counts. So look. Got that thing I was talking about, Mondrian. The front of the cube, the top of the cube. You know, if you start looking at it that way, it becomes three dimensional. Or else it can stay flat. But what I want to do here is start laying out some of these sections. And let some of the other painting show up. We'll cover some of it up because some of it's got to go. And I don't want to forget about this. And before I get too green, I'm going to shift the here. Okay, I could use one up there. All right. So now um, I got this white and green in here. So I think I'll add a third color and see what happens. But first, I'll put a little more white, slam it in there. And what do we got? Something that goes with green. Try blue. Oh, try those turquoise. It's a heavy color. Let's see how it changes. Okay. Let I think I'm going to go for a tan color. I started working into it. So let's see. I had a tube of this stuff. Unbleached titanium. Looks kind of thin. Paint's not coming out of it. Oh, no. So now, I set up a little bit there. Throw that in. Now let's give it all the light. Do we need to do any of that? Some up here. Okay. So now, let's set a little stand back and look and see what you got, Joe. And we're going to come back with a little bit of this now. I started with this little color. Started a little thing. Okay, I'll push it there. And my clip was pretty good, strong. I'll show up. I'm not killing too many things here. Okay, so what I did in the beginning, you know, there's two or three things underneath that I started with, but now I make a new section. It becomes a different shape. Just like, let's look at this thing here, all this business here. 
Let's just do this, yeah. Let's uh, Shoot through that, and then uh, we can free hand a few things. So now, let's say, uh, let's okay, say something there, and then, eh, I'll go over here, come back up if I, if I try to go over that. And then we could use a launcher like that. And let's see, I could use a line down here. I could use another crochet over here. Go up here and come across here. Come back down. I gotta see what I got. Am I right? Okay, and then I think what I'm going to do is come back with, oh, let's see, I'm going to find it. Let's try this. Let's see if this still can work. I need a different color then. So I'll go back to green or whatever, the turquoise color. Doesn't show up that good. Almost like making a collage with paint. But that's where painting is how the collage is easier to do because you're not using a mask, you're just pulling on top of each other. You know, or ideally, I'd make that a, a darker color, but I got time. I'll let it dry a while. But you see, it's just this like overworking everything. You work on top of it. Then you put another skeleton on top and then another skeleton and things from the beginning show through and then there's white things in the painting that fix stuff on top. So it all starts working together, hopefully. So let's see, um, let's try another color. Old yellow. I'm going to dress the paint, push it around just like you do in any other painting. Move it around, move it around. Okay, work it in good. That's how you get the brush strokes, like that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so now, uh, let's see. It'd be nice to see a big dark shape in there somewhere. So, and it's still, I'm still queuing on that tape being in half. So I think, let's see what I can do here. Dry it out, brush. Don't want too much water while. Okay, now um, it's also sometimes this works good in paintings is letting it drip. You see that in a lot of, you know, paintings, abstract paintings, especially New York paintings. It's just part of the painting process. And there's, sometimes it gets painted over, sometimes it lays on top. But when you try to do the spatter thing, you know, it doesn't work that well here. You gotta really have slabs of paint, like wet drippy paint. Okay, so let's back off and see what I got. All right, so now uh, I see where I have to move. It's like a chess game. Um, there's a, there's a there's another one that needs to be cut. Jeez. Run out of paint. 
I don't know what to do. All right. Red oxen. Rust. All right, so I'm going to open that up. stand back and say, okay, now there needs to be something over on this side because the paint's getting thicker over here, so I'll just come across that. Get over there, come back, look at it, no, okay, it's, uh, now I need some of that down here. If I got it down there, I probably need a little bit up here. Put that back up like that. Okay, so um try mm, something different here. Get some of this red. Cut that corner. I need a brighter red. Like that. Okay. Okay, so now let's go back and start painting a little bit slower. But... So I'm gonna curve weird something here. So I'm just kind of trying to stick to the whole field. At some point, you might have to dry a little bit. That color now is kind of acidic. And just go right through that one piece right there. Okay. The red can come down. We need something going this way. We need something here. And something up here. So now that's a big help for that. Stand up and see what it got. Okay, so now I'm starting to see something here. Just like, I mean, look, it's conceivable that a landscape or a cityscape painting could be started this way. You know, like when we did the river. And that. I mean, it's already there, but it's not trying to be that. But it just ends up that way. And if you paint a lot, you can start looking at it and say, oh, well, there's a face, there's a building. And that's what painters do, I think. And even the master painters, they'd start their paintings kind of loose and then they'd find the figures inside of it instead of pre-planning a 
Okay, so we could use whoop, a little more white. Look at that. Um, Sure. Yeah, tongue that down. But it's pretty bright peeking underneath there. Okay, so now it's time to go back this really well drawn. Yeah. Well, let's get low. Let's see. Let's try this. Yeah. Use this. So starting to pull some shapes out of it. And then I can't be, you know, I should also be willing to just start going through things. It's the only dark color they got, kind of dark color they got. So now we need to maybe start working for a bit of shape again, but I want to get rid of some of these purple. Make it lighter. It's much better. Come on. Question? No? como un millón de cosas para poner figuras y luego empiezo a pintar encima y pintar encima y ya ni siquiera se ven todas las figuras que me pasan. Quiet. <coughs> All right. So, uh, mm, nice color combination yeah. and see this is where people start getting into the like the way it's painted because if you try to do this careful here yeah, it looks that way it's sort of like yeah now yeah, i'm gonna get this out of here it's so, so much water all right so if i try to do this like and make it look like a, you know, an artistic, what you really gotta do is get in there and just slam it. Because that's the way when abstract painting, you see the paint pool up, you see the speed of the brush draw, you see the curve of the, the brush moving through the paint. I mean, it's more of that kind of language. 
then it is like, look at the nice nose, look at the nice eye. I mean, it's there. They can be painted that way, but we're not talking about that. We got rid of that. Now we're just talking about the paint and how it can flow. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, put the paint down, okay? Like that. Over here, too. Start brightening things up a little bit more. Across there. Down there. Okay, now let's go back and. So it's this process of drawing and painting things out abruptly. And you can't really, you can have sort of a plan, but if you've got too much of a plan, you may get disappointed because. Things change really fast when you're doing this. Yeah, you know, is this a gray? I mean, what is this? Oh, here we go. What is this? All right. basically what we're learning in graduate school, but 40 years later, it looks a little different. We're doing it big oil paintings, I had a teacher that did this, but that was like the entry level to get out of grad school was painting abstract expressionist. And I don't know what they do now. A lot of it's different, but let's see. I think uh, I could use something just go right to the web game see with oil this gets kind of tricky and that's what we're doing it in because you really got to be organized and also can turn into a big brown mess really quick but you can just practice small if you want to try this it's good to know it because it helps you, no matter what you paint, it helps you loosen up and free, be freer with the paint. and painting them out, painting the things and painting them out. Painting them out. It's a big shape I was looking for. But this puts more paint on it. Okay, so let's see what I got. Instead of taking maybe some more color, like my orange. Yeah, 
I think uh, perhaps that is a little bit of an outline. So let's use, here's a, yeah, I'll try this color in a while. Don't peel the top off. It doesn't have a hood. No, no. No. Okay. I'll cooperate, but there it is. So, let's put some of that out. And there's and some water. And so, now we're going to do some precision. the start of maybe putting some more of that around so I can start seeing more shades. So again, if I did it on this side, well, where are you going next? Well, just bounce across to the other side and find another shape that we can put over a bunch of stuff and make it one. So that would suggest now that I got them on the sides, I need something over here. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna break rank here. Go up here. Okay, so I see the back off. All right, well, I'm skipping somewhere abstractly. Let's see, it might need a nice new color. Um, let's see. Let's use this and see if it. Uh, because there's a blue. Yeah. Try that. Over here, 
to cut that line a little bit. Get that uh, more stable shape. And uh, make it a thicker point there. Let's see what we got. All right. And, okay, now I see something that needs to be done. That would be the step here. That's the problem. Gonna have a lot of messing up space to kind of do this, and also gets away from you pretty quick. Okay, I need. Mean, there's no gray. There it is. Okay. And some of this little water. Messed up later. Okay, let's see what we got here. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's see. I won't work on it too much longer. I'll do that later, but this is just setting me up. I don't know what I do with it, but you'll see next time. Let's... And uh, I need a little bit of that weight here. Let's say right here, a little part of that. Okay, go across there. And maybe here. Like that, like that. Choose a little bit here. Put that down. See what I got. All right. That's where I'll end it today. It's just when you look at it now. The only thing I do is I keep doing what I'm doing. But now I start to slow down painting. I use less of the straight edge and just find some more shapes that look like they're piled up. You know the way things are stacking up on top of each other and try to keep it clean. Like when it shines like this, with the light and you're scrubbing paint around, you actually get a darker, duller spot and brighter spots. It looks like it's getting hit by light, but it's all by benefactor of the paint, the benefit of the paint. It's just moving paint around and it's all mixing up. So after this would dry, I can't do what I said before, a lot of stuff, but I can come back and just clean it up and make it like some sort of, I don't want to say neater, but more organized composition. Okay, so let me go back here now. But you see, that's the way it's painting. I mean, that's the way painting is. And in the end, painters just deal with, how do you want it to look at the end? Do you want it to look wild? like you just started and you have a lot of energy or are you going to start like that and shut it down and make it neater and you know that's up to the individual you have to make that call to yourself as you do it but oh another thing i didn't do is when you do this it's good to keep turning you can turn it all four ways when you paint it because every time you turn it you get a different composition and if you paint it all four ways you attack it from all four sides and then at the end, you can pick out the best way it looks, you know, which looks the best way, which way looks the most like dynamic, the most, you slap the paint all over, you weren't timid about it. You know, you got a good solid design, even though it's complicated, it still needs to read simple, like one big plane of light. Okay. So any questions from the audience? Anybody? Yetta? <laughs> I, know you, just, I know you have a question. 
No, I don't have a question. I'm just so excited watching you just pushing oh, the paint. That's just, when you I'm get to that point. It. When you get to that point, that's when they talk about having freedom in painting, because that's real freedom. Freedom. You're not anybody's fool. You're not making anything for anybody. We're just enjoying pushing the paint around. But the problem is, you have to have some drawing background so you know what to do with it. You know, like when I go, I got to go here, I got to go here. No, I got to go over here. I mean, if I didn't know drawing, I'd just be working in the same spot all the time. And then I'd move to the next spot. But you can't know it overnight. You got to just try things. And if you don't like them, don't show anybody. Just keep it to yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, your own I understand that, but it's a little bit also like a dance. You know, it is. you're just kind of whoop, whoop, and then you look, and over there, I yeah. I, I find it absolutely exciting. I it's, can't wait. It's just the natural rhythm of yeah. everybody's body moves a different way. You got to figure and, that out, and you got to move your way through the canvas. You know, and you do it with your own movement and your own whatever you do, but that's what makes it unique and makes it your own. You know, it's coming from the inside. Right. Like, no, matter, no matter what you like to paint, yeah. it's like when I asked my professor, he painted all the trains when he was a kid yeah, and he yeah. got awards for it and that. And then he painted these big abstract paintings and he said, listen, I don't have to paint trains anymore. It's more like the big door of a boxcar. It's all uh -huh. rough. It comes out anyway, yeah. you know? No matter what you think, yourself is coming out and it's revealing yourself through the pain. Right. But if you think about it too much, you get in the way. <laughs> I, I get you gotta, it. You got to step back and let yourself go. That's all. I and get I it. I urge you to just experiment with it. That's all. You know, and don't worry about it. Just no. the only problem is that, you know, to do this decent, you have to have a certain amount of pain. You have to use pain. Yeah. So you have to buy cheap paint in the biggest quantities you can. And then use it that way. So if you're a little shy about paint, but that's the only way you're going to learn how to paint anyway. You know, you got to actually spend the money on the paint as hard as it is. So, all right. Okay. Anything Listen, else? I'll just say it seems like you can really see how, like, there are times when you're ending up just kind of accidentally with colors against other colors and going, wow, that looks good together. I mean, that's what I was really seeing. That's when, what it is. You know, it's a chance. But the thing about it is you have to recognize it, yeah. you know? And I mean, when you're young painting, you don't recognize it. It's always got to be something different. But as you do this more, you step back and look at it and go, oh, I couldn't have did that if I tried. You know? <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. So, all right. That's great. Anybody else? Um, yeah, before you go, I, I, don't, um, I wanted to talk about getting permission from you to record the session because- I'll Yeah. I'll hit record and it says ask the host to give you permission to record. Oh, how do I do that? Um, I sent you a link. Well, let's talk about it during the week. Okay. Email me, okay? okay? Well, and I'll get it figured out. Okay. All right. Okay. So, is that it? Did everybody have enough? I know I did. <laughs> yeah, I, that was a workout. Oh, well. Hey, it's... Somebody's got to do it, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Michael, are you signing up for next semester? I'm not sure what's going on yet. Yeah, it's going to be online. Oh. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure. Yeah. We'll see. Okay, I got to see how this ends up. All right? Yeah. And I'm going to have to start barking. There's like half of you aren't here, so it's time. I'm going to send out an email to everybody. I'll give you guys kudos, but I'm going to lean on the other people because if they start getting lazy, that's no good. Good on you guys for being here and being here on time. Well, thank All right. you. All right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll see you next week. Maybe next week we should uh, have a little critique and look at what you're doing. Okay. Right. Let's cool. get this thing on top of that. We're getting near mid semester, so it's time. All right. Okay. Okay, then. If there's have nothing else. Home. Okay. Have a good weekend. Okay, you guys. Have a good weekend, too. See you later. Bye. 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 Be happy. Bye.